Good morning, Nairobi Chapel. Oh, that's better. Um, look, it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this uh, conversation on the challenge of integrity in leadership. It's set within the context of First Timothy chapter three, where the Apostle Paul is instructing Timothy on how to choose leaders to, to steer the church in Ephesus. Timothy is young, as my panelists are, as I used to be, and what we're hoping for is a vulnerable conversation because many of us lead um, in various spaces, you know, families, society, community, work, and we know that leadership can often be a lonely and frustrating experience. So Narima Sakaja, welcome. Narima, I'll start with you because you founded Siasa Place, You've been the executive director for about five years now. What does integrity mean to you, particularly within the context of the work you do, um, preparing young people to engage with governance? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thought the second time I'd be a bit better. I'm still as nervous. Um, um, but then. But you don't look nervous. I, and don't, you don't I am sound. shaking. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but happy to be here. I, to answer your question, so the reason why I started Siasa Place is because I was interning in DC and I was working for a company that worked in 30 countries in Africa. And my boss was a, a typical, um, very wealthy white male. And so one day we're in a meeting and Burundi had just gone through their civil war. And so he looks at me and he says, what are the youth of Burundi doing? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm Kenyan. And so it was that question where it's like, but isn't that just one country? I knew I had to leave, so I did. And so Siasa Place is a platform where we engage youth on governance processes. But when I was registering it, it was rejected three times uh, because of the word Siasa. I was asked, um, you can't register an entity as Siasa and you're not a political party. And then um, I was also told that the word Siasa is banned, which by the way, now I own the word Siasa, I trademarked it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> um, I fought back and, and that's where I first interacted with integrity because I was being told you either, you know, give a piece of land, then maybe you'll get your certificate or part with 250,000 and maybe you'll get your certificate. It was a long process, it was difficult. I didn't do any of those two, um, but it not to mean that you get to interact with this every day. That's when I knew this is going to be a challenge. So integrity is doing the right thing, even when you are alone and it's challenging, being honest and authentic to me. That's how I view integrity. And, and because I, see, I started Siasa Place on that footing, I knew that I couldn't go any other way but to be integral. Great, thank you. So you're 32 now. You'd have started Siasa Place when you were about 25, 26, which was around the time that a survey came out, uh, the Kenya Youth Survey Report, which found that 50% uh, of Kenyan youth believe that how um, wealth is created um, doesn't matter as long as you don't get caught. You don't go to jail. Uh, so when you're interacting with people, young people, what are you doing that sets them apart, given that even for young people, the value of integrity is already compromised? It doesn't matter. It is difficult because, you know, who are the people that we look up to? If we look at our leaders, um, it's the ones who were able to get wealthy really quickly. And, and even when you talk to a lot of people, they are entering politics because they are viewing it as business. It's no longer about service. It's no longer about it being a calling because it's a very difficult job. So I cannot really blame those youth for saying that. But also from that statistic, we forget the other 50% who said that they wouldn't. They would do the right thing. And so it's just to say that there are pockets of, of young people who admire hard work and the process, but just because for some leaders we're not sure where their wealth comes from, it's not declared. 
and nothing basically happens to them. We have a member of parliament who actually through the courts was sentenced, but he left jail after what, three months. So we, we don't really hold these people accountable. And, and it's worrying because now you come and tell youth, you guys live right, do the right thing, but us over here, we can do whatever we want. But you guys, you guys have to live different from us. It's not possible. So it's not to say that it's something we can't change, we can. And, and through our engagements, we've been able to mobilize youth in different counties through county budget processes to hold county government accountable. But it's difficult to work because I get phone calls from, from governors, from MCAs, because I'm over here igniting youth and bringing problems. They want youth to remain ignorant. Right now, the people who are busy asking youth to go and vote are people who are aspiring to be elected. It's not incumbents. They don't want more youth to come and compete for their position. They don't. And so it's a difficult space to be in, but I'm hopeful that with the little pockets of people such as myself, we're able to live as examples and people are able to see change. Thank you, Narima. So can you turn? So Kaja, I'll turn to you because when we first met, you were about 25, 26 as well. Yep. Um, you uh, had a party, a TNA. Um, but before we get into that, I'd, I'd like to ask you the same question. What does integrity mean to you? Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Good afternoon, church. Salimene <laughs> kwahewa. It's, it's, it's amazing, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to have this discussion. Integrity comes from the root word integer. Don't do that again. An integer, <laughs> it just means oneness, one. What you say is what you believe, is what you do. In public and in private. It's wholesomeness. And um, I think many of us really should thrive to it and we all struggle with integrity. We feel certain ways and do different things. We preach water and drink wine, um, but it's just the oneness and, 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 and we get it. I think the root is from the Bible. So sorry about the mathematics of integer, you know my background, <laughs> but I think that's, that's what it is, just being one. Hmm. So I, I talked about um, you being the chairman of uh, TNA you are the youngest uh, chairperson of a ruling party in the world. But to what extent do you believe that your leadership journey is as a result of your own um, personal attributes versus the phenomenon we see in Kenya, of people touting briefcase political parties for hire? Uh, for me, I have had a very compelling and clear call since I was very young. Um, which I, I've been very sure about. Um, it's not a vocation or a job that I've been looking for. In fact, I feel jobless because I, 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 I'm sure I was made to do this. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you um, and those who've given me opportunities to serve. Um, but I guess it's a mix of both because I always knew since I was very young and I remember leading a, a strike when I was eight years old a demonstration. What was the strike about? This was a So there school. are two strikes. The okay. first one was when I was, I think, turning six. I didn't want to go to nursery school um, because all my friends had gone up to, to class one. So I had this banner, no class one, no school. And I had I'd signed my first contract with Mr. Karuga, who was the headmaster, and told me, if you come to Aga Khan Primary, um, so, so I skipped a class. I said, if you come, pass the interview. If you ever go below number 10, you'll go back. Even if you reach class eight, if you go below number 10, you'll go back to nursery. And so that, that held me to account. And that was the first demonstration. The second one is something that to date is close to my heart. Um, so we lived in Gara, um, with, of course, with my parents. And uh, it was those estates that were later, I don't know how to use the word gentrified. Gentrified? Uh, like divided. Uh -huh. So there was Asians and the Nas. Same estate, but they put a fence between us. And our side, was the walls were brown, very dirty. And on their side, it was clean, there was grass, and the kids would ride motorbikes. 
And I was like, wait a minute, don't you deserve the same thing? And so I led the kids to actually demonstrate about the state of our estate, that we deserved better. That we deserved cleanliness, we deserved uh, you know, better environment, playing grounds, etc. So then I became a prefect, I was head boy, I went to a very proper school, I don't know what's wrong with everybody, Nick. This guy, you know, but anyway, for those of us who went to the great Duke of York, up the road, we, we really feel for you guys, and it's CSR for us to really see that you can be anything if you went to Nairobi school. And, and, and there's, a, there's a good God. But so through leadership in school and at the university, it's a mix of both. So I felt called to it. I thought I'd do it in my retirement, maybe after 60, because most people don't give their best life to this country. But I'm glad that I've had an opportunity to give the best of my years in serving this country and not as a retirement, but as a calling to, to serve. So it's a mix of both. And finally, of course, somebody wanted to be president twice, so maybe they can use this young person, and they used, and uh, they became president. One was already president, I started with President Kibaki. Vijana na Kibaki, if you remember. Um, I started as a driver, and I went up the ranks. Those days I used to be, Reverend Ondachi used to do Bible study with us in Mission Driven. That's how I got in. Um, Mission Driven being your gospel group. Yeah, we had a band, I used to play, and rap. Um, so, yeah, for real, I can rap even now. So it's a mix of both. Somebody so that they can use it. So it's opportunity finding the right time. That mm -hmm. somebody needs you and also you have a calling to it. So I don't feel used. Mm -hmm. I think it was symbiotic. Mm -hmm. And even now I'm, I, I'll also have an opportunity to use somebody else. That's just how it is. Right. No. So, so tell me then about the briefcase political party issue because you're telling us that you have a, a calling. Um, but many of us... Um, I, I think it's unfair to say that Kenyans are, are as jaded and cynical as I am, but every time we hear that a, a party is being formed, you know, there's this achingly familiar sense that this is not, it, it is not based on any sort of ideology or value system. It is based on hawking yourself to the highest bidder um, and the person that you think is l most likely to get into um, you know, to, to be elected, which means, therefore, that you're automatically carried with them. So we have a long history of... Um, Briefcase political party. Of single party rule. Right, okay. We start with that. Um, until 1991, when Section 2 was repealed, we had only one party. And after that, I think there was that clamor to have more political parties. So we got into multipartism when Section 2 was repealed. But the multi was really multiplied. So right now we have 86 parties. I don't think we have 86 ideologies. I don't think there's 86 ways of looking at this country, but it's part of democratic growth. You know, we try to compare ourselves with the US and say, ideally we should have two parties with two ideologies, like the Democrats and Republics, uh, Republicans, or Labour and Conservative. But Tony Blair said something in his book that, look, for a growing democracy, it's about efficacy. There cannot be two distinctly different ideologies in this country because we're still dealing with the basics. There's, every party will try to deal with education, with water, with health. It's all the same. It's about efficacy. Who do you trust to do it better? So yes, we have a lot of briefcase parties. Many people want to start parties where they can get nomination fees um, and do business with it. But that is not why we did TNA. I have believed very strongly in institutionalizing our politics and that we must change how we see our country. So I'm, I'm very firm and I'm very proud of the work we were able to do then. Um, and we didn't just walk it to the highest bid. I was very clear. I believed strongly in the person of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, that he was the person God wanted to be president at that time. Um, I believe very strongly in his vision. We can discuss his record after the service, but I, 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 I really believed that that's what we, we needed. And I think there's be, it was a proper transition from President Kibaki. So we didn't hawk, the, I mean, I didn't get a shilling out of it, but then I nominated myself into parliament. That's what I gained. It was a fight. It's also another story and I got an opportunity to serve. And that's why I'm proud of Nerima and what she's doing. Because, be, because young people must take up this space. Um, we're the majority, but young people want to be defined more than just being an overquoted statistic. They want to be defined by hope and by playing their role in the country that, that we're building. Right, thank you. Nerima. So the setting of First Timothy is that Paul is instructing um, Timothy on how to uh, lead um, and one of the things he says is let no one despise you on account of your youth 
So what challenges have you faced as a young leader because of your youth? Um, I think also me, I'll add youth, then petite, <laughs> and then a woman. woman. Yeah, um, because I, the space that I'm in is very male dominated. So a lot of times I'm underestimated, but I had to utilize that as a strength because people don't see you coming, yeah? So by the time they're like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, you've already, so I use that as a strength. But also the fact that there's a lot of um, money exchanging hands, especially some decisions that happen. So you find yourself in rooms where you don't agree with it happening. And so I've also found myself kicked out of those rooms or uninvited. That happens. Uninvited or disinvited? Because oh. there's a difference. It's, yeah, it's uninvited. Uh -huh. You didn't get the invitation. <laughs> I didn't get it. Okay, yeah. as opposed to having the invitation withdrawn. Mm -hmm. I didn't get it, but also a lot of times people, you know, trying to push for me to get it, and it's a clear, no, we don't want her here, we know how she is. And, and, and that verse um, in First Timothy 4.12, it's not just on your youth, look down on you because of your youth, but to live by faith, by love, and by integrity. So, so I choose to live that daily, um, but I also find myself overworking because I have to know more, because I have to prove more. And, and it's, it's, it's tough. And I also find myself being so tough on my team uh, because we have to have this image where people, when, when we were starting, people are like, ah, the youth. They create a platform, um, they are given some funding, and then they use it terribly, then they disappear. So people don't have faith in the youth. So you have to create this image and also work extra hard to make sure that you're accountable, you're transparent, you're visible. So my team works terribly hard. And, and that's what I feel also, I'm sure Sakaji, you went through that, where you have to prove yourself. And when you're competing with people who just show up and they already have their credibility, um, and, and it's unfair. But also another challenge is not having access. There's, there's the access to finance, there's the access to power. There's a certain power dynamic that happens. It might not always be visible, but in certain rooms, there are certain people who make decisions, even before the meeting happened. <laughs> There's already a decision that this meeting is gonna go this way. And if you're not in the kitchen of understanding that and that conversation, then you'll never know. You've already wasted time, but people have already made this decision a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And those are the few that I can think around, but also for women, there's a lot of sexual harassment. I've, I've found myself, because I'm having a meeting with a certain politician, I'll, and I know where he's heading, I'll have to dress myself in a t-shirt and jeans so that I look like I'm a university student. So that when we're together publicly, he would even feel ashamed, because he looks old enough to be my grandfather. He would even be ashamed to try and approach. Because, you know, there's a sense of, okay, now you're beginning to look like my granddaughter or daughter. So there are ways where you've had to use different techniques, and it's completely different for a woman as compared to a man. And navigating this space as a young woman is not easy, is not easy. But it's something that we encourage to support young women to do and to create a safer environment. Mm. But the last thing, as much as we have all those parties, 17 million people are registered in political parties. 4.5 million of those people are young people. So even that participation, there are not that many young people who are party members. And I don't even want to go to the numbers of women because they are below 1 million in a country of 50 million. We are not engaging and we are not engaging right. We'll come back to that because um, my follow-up question to you is really based on the Constitution because we've talked about the Bible and Paul's instructions to Timothy, but our Constitution offers us um, guidance on how to choose leaders. Um, and to paraphrase what it says, it tells us that we must choose people of personal integrity, competence, and suitability. And so you've talked to us about the problems of being a young leader, um, but where have you fallen short as a leader? 
Where have you compromised your competence, your integrity, your suitability? Where have you fallen short? One time, and it's only one time so far. <laughs> um, and that's when I was in a political meeting. And after the meeting, all of a sudden we were being huddled to another side room. I, it didn't connect until I start seeing someone now distributing... Envelopes? Yeah. Brown envelopes. Envelopes. Brown envelopes. And then, and then he came to me. So um, first I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm okay. And then the whole room went quiet. Um, it was like a room with 10 people. The whole room went quiet and now all stared at me. And I felt uneasy. And one man said, if she doesn't take it, we're all gonna be in trouble. Because it means that I can now be like a witness and um, I'm a loose end. And so he was like, if she doesn't take it, we're all in trouble. And now the pressure, I was afraid, I took it. And I remember as soon as I left, I actually called my dad. And I said, I feel so bad. I've taken this money, I didn't want it. Um, I just, I just don't, I don't want to associate with this anymore. So from that point, I, I stopped um, engaging in that space and I removed myself because I knew this would become more and more difficult for me and it's, it's a conflict um, with my faith, with my integrity. So I just removed myself from that space. Right. Um, Sakaja, where have you fallen short? Uh, many um, places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everyone knows. But bef <laughs> before that, just allow me to really um, support what Nerima said. I think our, our claim to a democracy is tainted when we have half the team not involved. The place of women is so important in this country, in leadership, so important. And I can't overemphasize it. One of the things I'm proud of when I was chair of TNA is that I set such serious rules. First, everyone thought I was a joker. I was like 26, 27, and chairing a party of people older than my dad. But I was very firm. There were articles out there saying, uh, Sakaja's inexperience will cause over the presidency. Guys were like, is this guy out of his mind? How, how does a 50-year-old running for president get a 26-year-old to run a party? But I was very firm that if you bring violence, if you try to, if there's sexual harassment, if you try to intimidate women and youth, I'll disqualify you no matter who you are, whether you're a minister, an MP. And I'm proud that because of that, in the 10th parliament, between 2013 and 2017, of all the parties, TNA had the highest number of women in parliament. Out of 16 women in parliament in single member constituencies, eight, half, were from TNA. You remember Cecily Mbarire, um, uh, Mary Wamboi, Alice Nganga, Alice Wahome, uh, the lady from Taveta, Naomi Shaban, all of those because of that. But Nerima, many times, people will make it look like, you know, that you have to wear your t-shirt and jeans, that they say that the biggest stumbling block for women in politics is their femininity. It is not. It is the biggest strength. Don't try and man up. Because that is not the flavor that's missing in our politics. We want, of course, the data and the statistics, but the ability to see beyond the numbers and see the faces and have a compassionate heart is so uniquely natural with women. So even as you talk to these young women, don't tell them to man up. Don't tell them to dumb down or reduce their femininity. That's the flavor we need. That's not what she's saying. That's, what that's not what she's No, I'm not saying she said that, but I'm asking her to do that mm. deliberately. At I, I will ask them to do that if we talk about the security in our parties. When men are hiring goons yeah. to come and attack you, women, you know this, they are actually scared of getting raped. I huh? know. You know this. Mm. So I will only do that if the safety 
is guaranteed. And, and, Hold and on. This... No, no, hang on. I want to ask you a question because you are telling Narima what to do, don't dumb down this, that, yeah. the other. What message are you sending to men? I'm coming back to you on the integrity, yes. integrity question. But a lot of the violence we see around political contestation um, directed at women is orchestrated by men. Of course. Right. And, and so you... what is your message? What are you doing? What are you saying? What commitments are you making around the way that men behave when it comes to women? So it's, it's not just making commitments. I have said what I did as a chair. Going forward. What I did as a chair. Going forward, all parties must have such high standards against violence against this gunism and create a safe space. But I'm encouraging the women that despite that, I think Mother Karua was here recently. There's a reason she's called the Iron Lady. Twice, a couple of times. I mean, I see so and much strength in her. she talked about it and she took issue with it. I see strength in Susan Kihika. I see strength in a lot of these ladies who've come out. And I assure you, the value they add is very different. So I commit as Senator of Nairobi that I'll do all I can to make sure that young, women and even older women who need you know, that safe space and expression politically are supported. I personally mentor many young men. I don't mentor women. I mentor young men. I would love to mentor young women. But I encourage them that, because many of them are put down from a very young age. Mm -hmm. In politics, you talk about Thank women, it is, it is older women. Right. When you talk about youth, it is boys. Sakaja, 18 to 24, where are they? Come back to the question. Yeah. Where have you fallen short? So I've fallen short severely. Yeah, and, 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 and I think the women issue can never be overemphasized. But anyway, beyond that, I've fallen short severally. Um, I think the most <laughs> recent event was when I was doing oversight at night around the city. So there was a, there was a situation now, seriously though, um, where I, was, I broke the rules that have been set on curfew. And uh, so there was a court process after that. And I remember it was a Friday, and this like 10, 15 Subarus came, and you know, whatever happened, happened. I was a villain on that Saturday because of what I did. On Monday, I took responsibility. I felt I'd let down uh, my family, my children, the young people who look up to me. I think there are a few. I'd let them down. I thought about my son, JB, I thought about Tangai, I thought about my little girl, Emily, that they'll always know this. But I took responsibility, I resigned from being chair of COVID um, committee. I relinquished that position. People were shocked because they used to, I'd rather die than, than resign. But, and I never miss an opportunity to say I'm sorry about and I apologize to all of you. But after that, then I, 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 I it hit me that actually people have high expectations and standards um, of us. But also we're human. Yeah? Um, you might see me on TV and think as we are, we, we, we are just like you. We all make mistakes. No one is perfect. And I've never tried to appear as if I'm perfect. So I think that is one of the situations. Okay. But I'm glad that I, I got restoration after that. Okay. Um, yeah. Where have you faced challenges in your leadership because on account of your youth? So as I gave the example in the beginning, uh, many people didn't have the respect of this young person. Because you were 26. Because I was 26. But, and that's why I, I, I really like, like the, free, the scripture that was used about 1 Timothy 4.12, about setting an example. There's a power in an example. I've had, so in, in the beginning, everyone was skeptical, like, this is how you young man, you know? Sometimes I was in meetings where people would go into their vernacular and I'm just looking at them and I'd start, you know, I'd walk out and say, I think the meeting is over because now you're talking amongst yourselves. I was consistent in the example I set. I remember in a party, and you, when you have a party that's extremely popular, certain parts of the country, you know, if you have this ticket of this party, like if you're, if you're in Nyanza and you have Tibim, you know, if you have that ticket, you're straight, isn't it? If you're in Mount Kenya and you had uh, that time TNA, you're, you've gone through. So many people would want to meet me privately, Kunyona Kando, and I refused. And I said, if any candidate wants to meet me, come with your opponents, all of you. I'll meet you together. See, if you guys conspire together, it's okay. But I would not meet anybody alone. I was offered 35 million once. In hindsight, I think I was really a fool. Because it could have, you know, it, was, it could have been useful. Imagine a 26-year-old, I was, you know. But I refused. For a ticket, just a ticket. 
for someone who's actually quite popular and a lot of resources from, you know, let me not mention the person. But the consistency of setting an example then is what led me to where I am today. If I took that money, if I took money from aspirants, if I rigged, and I think those who know politics know that probably one of the most fairest run political primaries was of TNA when I was running it. I'm not blowing my trumpet, but it might be so complicated that I'm the only one who knows how to blow it. It was the best run and fair. And as politicians who've gone through parliament, that one they said, yo, I Mzuri. I refuse that money. So the disdain and the skepticism and cynicism turned into respect because of setting an example, consistency. If I didn't do it, I would not be a nominated MP that I was, and I doubt I'd have been elected to serve you as your senator. So you, de you, de you defy that gratification. For many Kenyans, corruption is just a lack of opportunity. It is not that they have the same, you know, those, the values against, it's just you don't have the chance to be corrupt. But given the chance, you would be corrupt. Integrity is that which you do, even when you're on your own. So I've, I've had so many chances. In parliament, sometimes money, I mean, we've had stories of money being brought there. I've, incidentally, I've never been, apart from once, I've never been approached. I don't know why. Um, Is it possible that uh, money doesn't move you, but you have other things that uh, um, you favor? Yes. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be president of Kenya one day. And I believe that if I, if, if, I, if I mess up now, I will not become president. So I see everything as an interview. So I might enjoy being senator, Nichome, and then now in 10 years, how will I explain to you? Or, you know, next year I'm running for governor. I, I squander that opportunity. I go in the same old story of the ones who've been there before me, and then what? So I have the perspective of a long game. And I'm inspired by stories of Tom Boyer, of those who've been before us, when they were young and what they did. And so the money may not move me, but, and this came from my mom. I hold it very close to my heart because it's the last thing she told me before she died when I was nine years old. She told me a good name is worth more than riches. I think it is true. Mm. A good name, a reputation is worth more. It's worth more, it's worth more by far than riches. Okay, I'll ask you the same question that I'm going to ask uh, Narima now, because you've taken us back into Kenya's political history, and you talk about the inspiration of Tom Boyer. And Narima, um, when we look at Kenya's history, anyone who was inspiring, like Tom Boyer, like J.M. Karyuki, was cut down. Okay, so we're talking about leadership, we're talking about integrity. Um, you know, Sakaja here would like to be president. And he's telling us that he's a person of integrity. I'm not saying I'm a person of integrity. I say I try. You've tried, okay. Yeah, but I'm human. You know, and, 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 I, and I, I'm fairly certain that there are people listening to you in the congregation online who are inspired by you. Okay? So tell us what that looks like from where you sit, grooming young people for leadership, and yet we know that our leadership um, landscape in Kenya does not favor, um, and perhaps I'm showing my bias here, does not necessarily favor people of character, of conviction, of vision, and of competence. Absolutely, we, we have to start um, praising and magnifying our leaders of integrity. The problem is, and, and this, this one hurts personally because I've, I've seen it happen with my grandfather when he lost his position as minister, and also when he passed on, and how the newspapers, the front pages, how they covered him as a poor man, so from politician to pauper, and, and they had an image of him in a shuka. Why did he lose his, um, carry no, on? No, they had an image of him in a shuka and barefoot, he was on his farm, and um, Moi fired him over the radio, the way he normally does back in the day, but he's someone who wouldn't take bribes. In fact, he's recognized as one of the politicians who was very integral. And he was very, very, very sure and certain that he would always say, this is something that I'm sure about. Everything I have, I've worked for. But people don't even know the late Honorable Robert Matano. We don't praise those people. And, and we also have to start with engaging our youth, because people like Sakaja can't do that alone. 
the, the atmosphere has to change in terms of how people view those particular individuals and we want to be able to uplift them into positions of power. But it's, it's not impossible, it's possible. We're seeing youth in the communities voting for the right leaders at MCA level. So the turnover is very high. So it means they're observing. We just lose our way when we go up the ladder. So I'm hopeful that the youth will make the right decisions eventually, but it has to be platforms such as mine and many others, even the church, to be able to highlight and media to highlight. Because a big win for me was the Daily Nation putting a front page of, of young people on Friday last week. That's something I've been pushing for months. With Nation Media, with editors, they have to change in terms of media who they highlight. It's not a two-horse race. There are so many people, thousands, going for leadership, and a lot of them are young. Support them. Okay. Um, Sakaja, the same question um, comes to you, which has to do with, you know, unfortunately, it does seem that, um, you, you know, if you look at, you know, personal integrity, competence, and suitability, we don't necessarily use that standard, um, you know, when we elect leaders. Uh, you are a former, you know, many of our legislators have come up through the University of Nairobi, have been student leaders. Um, so, you know, there's you refusing to take money, but there are others, you know, who are not quite on that, um, don't make the same decisions as you, right? Um, whether it's fighting, or it's, whether it's the belligerence, whether it's just downright, you know, unleadership qualities. I've just invented a word here. Um, what would you say when it comes to the way we vote, but also just the fact that, as you were saying earlier, we have a very low standard yeah. for the election of leaders, and then once we elect these people with a low standard, our expectations jump. Yeah, we are, we are, we are very low standards. You, know, you, you, you people have very low standards <laughs> in how you choose leaders. And I'll give you an example. How many, many of you are in a chama, an investment group, an estate WhatsApp group, and you decide to choose a, a treasurer. And you're like, hey, we can't give Baba, Baba Kamau. That one, we know him in, in Mkora. We can't give, this is the treasurer. You're so, you have such high standards at the lowest level because you own that 100K. But now when you're choosing someone in charge of 40 billion for your county as a governor, somebody in charge of 3 trillion for the country because you don't own it. In 2016, I remember my slogan when I was going for governor then, before moving to Senate, was I am Nairobi. Because I realized a lot of us in Nairobi don't feel like we own the city. It's like we're just passing. If I ask you where you're from, you'll say I'm from Siaya, I'm from Muranga. Ask you where do you stay, you'll say well, I live in Karen, I live in Kilimani. Just a few, a small section will say I'm from Jerry or I'm from Kaluleni. Until you own this country that it's ours, there are no angels who will sort it out. There's no angel with a magic wand who will become the governor of Nairobi or whatnot. Until we own it, then we'll, we'll have a high standard of choosing. So we have very low standards in electing. And then once you elect us, you have extremely high standards. Salazma to become a mungu. That at the Senate, at the MP, you forget that we're also human. I think we need to do it the other way around. Let's interrogate before we vote. Let us look at the standards of leadership. And I, in, the, in the earlier service, I remembered uh, Pastor M's someone on the four C's. I only remembered two. But Reverend Nick reminded me of the other two. Look for someone with a compelling vision, with character, with competence. The other C. Conviction. Compassion, Compassion. And, con and conviction. Yeah. Use that standard. Then number two, the church... And, and that's why we're seeing very low registration numbers. I'm even here the young guys were not registered because we're not inspired. The church must realize that this politics is not something you watch on TV. I think COVID has taught you that it matters who's in charge. It actually matters, and your vote matters. Bad leaders are elected by good people who don't vote. And you think we're removed. We actually should be trampled upon, like the Bible says. Of what value is the salt? See, so you're the salt of the earth, aren't we? Do you put salt next to your food or inside it? You, take, you put it and you mix it. But the church wants to stand next to it. Oh, we not allow politicians to talk. Oh, politics is so immoral. You leaders, you politicians. The church has lost its saltiness. How many of you are vying for a position? 
How many of you support people of character and integrity to run? Yeah, I had a, I had a meeting on, uh, on Thursday evening as I wind up with a gentleman. He's a businessman, he's, he's in the startup setting. And he told me, you know, I want to commit to support your campaign. Because I know, since you're going for governor, a lot of the cartels will come to give you money. Please don't take money from them. I will give you this much. A small amount. Who are you supporting? Why should I take money from the guys who ruined garbage collection in Nairobi, roads in, in Nairobi? Because I'll, I'll need resources. Who are you? Don't, don't even support me. Support somebody else on top of supporting me. Support somebody else. Get into the place. Vie for office. Remember, you're the salt. You, should, you must be inside it. That's all, the only way we'll change our country. But too many times, we let the wrong people make the decisions. And finally, very few of you are members of parties. So you think you're going to make a decision on August the 9th. You won't make a decision. You'll be choosing from a pre-selected menu of those who are in parties who went for nominations and chose people to vie. So you've been given for a list of four names. You're choosing the tallest in a class of dwarfs. Where were you? And then we'll say what is wrong with leadership after that, surely, guys. I rest my case. So I'll beg the indulgence of uh, Reverend Nick and uh, Reverend Ondachi to ask this final question. Because Nerima, Sakaja, you're both Christians, which is why you're on this panel uh, speaking to the congregation. But I recall a couple of years ago when we had a, you know, a, a series um, and we had, if I'm not mistaken, a judge. Um, and I'm, I think we're talking about corruption. And he said that one of the problems, um, you, you, you know, he finds that the, the, the people who appear in terms of corruption misdeeds are usually Christians because we come to church on Sunday, as we have done today, and then the rest of the week we go and, you know, carry on because Kenya works in a certain way. And so my question to you is this. We see that these um, problems we've been discussing are replicated across every sector. What would you like to see from the members of this congregation, uh, from Nairobi Chapel, um, Christians, Kenyans, individually and collectively, to strengthen integrity and leadership? Narima. Supporting a candidate. That's where I would start in terms of even allowing them to have platforms to come, speak with the youth, share their manifestos, their policies, their ideas, and even finances. Because a lot of us in the church, we support people when they're in hospital or when we're supporting funerals. Why can't we support people who can put proper systems in place so that we don't have to take care of them because they're in hospital or for funerals? Do it before that. And, and the church is so powerful to be able to do that. So powerful. So start using your power in the church. Pray and act. Don't just pray and say, we'll pray for you. Don't. Pray and act. Thank you, Nerima. Sakaja. Nerima is just spot on. This prayer for, you know, to tomba it doesn't work. It's, faith is nothing without actions. And we've let the space of the most important thing. And many of you, and I'm glad I'm talking to a very intelligent congregation. This is not a congregation for Vijana uh, Tibim. This is a very serious congregation. It's a very serious congregation. And many of you are in business or you work, you know, somewhere, and you think you're comfortable where you are. And you leave this dirty job for the dirty guys like Sakaja. Let me tell you, there are four things that hold a nation together, that hold a society together. The learning of the wise, the righteous of the great, the justice of the great, the prayers of the righteous, the learning and the valor of the brave. But those things mean nothing without leadership that understands the art of ruling. So in your one sector, you might think you're doing well, but once we have the wrong people, John Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership. Once you have the wrong people, I'm, I promise you that be a shadow of yours. It took 100 years, I mean, we had a railway built over, you know, more than 100 years ago. How long did it take to uproot it? Three hours. So engage. Be a member of a party. Find a candidate to support. Encourage them and pray. Send them 5K, 2K, a million, 10 million, whatever it is. But this country won't change on its own. And in the words of Tomboya, there are no supermen. It is us to change this country. I'll finish with a quote from Jomo Kenyatta. 
He says that, because we've spoken about what they did before, and those young people, when Tomboya was doing Little Town Constitution, Lennox Boyd Settlement, he was in his 20s. When he was in Kaluleni, and cops would come and bust through his door, they'd find him chilling out with Nyerere. He was in his 20s, they'd go to London to negotiate with the Mzungu. These guys had, their parents were not educated. They had nowhere to look up for inspiration. They looked sideways for affirmation. And they did it. But today, our young people, in as much as our ancestors, our fathers, might have been heroes of the past, it's for us to be the architects of the future. So let's engage. Thank you. So there were several mic drop moments. I think we just um, heard uh, a couple. And so Narima Wako and Sakaja Johnson, thank you. Thank you so very much um, you. for your sharing this morning. My phone number is 0721 <laughs> 326070. Okay. Thank you.